Hi, and welcome to Teaching and Learning in Tough Times, Wellness Practices for Teachers and Learners. My name is Mike Wong, and I am a teaching and learning consultant here at Conestoga College. The goals for the, today's sessions are outlined on the slide here, and they are number one, to discuss the relationship between faculty and student stress. We will also experience and discuss mindfulness and other strategies as a method of stress reduction. And lastly, we will discuss the impact of stress reduction strategies in the classroom. I want to start this session off with a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is shown on the slide here. And that's that the information discussed in this session may be personal as we reflect on our experiences with teaching and working during the COVID-19 outbreak. At some point in this session, I will present to you a list of activities that you can participate in. So at any point in time, if you're not comfortable participating in any of the activities, or if you're not comfortable with the topic that we are discussing, then please, please do not feel pressured to engage in those activities or in those discussions. I right, simply fast forward the video to a portion where you are comfortable. In terms of the approach we'll take for this, for this session, we're gonna take a research and knowledge-based knowledge -based approach in the examination of stress and stress reduction. And we will focus on mental well-being rather than on mental disorders. I'd like to begin this session with a question, which is what are some faculty stressors? And you can approach this question by thinking about what are some stressors that you as a faculty member have experienced, or if you're not comfortable doing that, you can approach this question by thinking about what are some stressors that faculty in general might experience. So at this point of the session, what I'd like you to do is to pause your video for one or two minutes and to reflect on and to jot down what some of those stressors might be. So as you, as you reflect on that question and, and as, you, as you think about the stressors that either you or faculty in general are, are going through or are experiencing, you'll probably notice that there are a lot of stressors that you might have identified that are typically part of our lives, even before the COVID-19 outbreak. But as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak, you might have also noticed that there are stressors that you either didn't have to think about before, right? So new stressors as a result of the pandemic or stressors that have been worsened or exacerbated as a result of the outbreak. Now, a few months ago and fairly recently, there was a rapid review that was published by Brooks and colleagues where they wondered what are some of the more commonly reported stressors that people might experience during times of social isolation and quarantine. Now, of course, because COVID-19 is relatively new, there isn't a lot of literature on the types of stressors that people are experiencing right now. So what Brooks and colleagues did was they essentially scoured the literature and they looked at other instances of social isolation and quarantine that have happened in the past. So some examples that they pulled from included uh, quarantine during SARS, uh, MERS, H1N1, and the Ebola outbreak. And what they found when they narrowed down the literature to those research papers that were most relevant to COVID-19 is that some of the more commonly reported stressors that people reported experiencing as a result of lockdown, social isolation, and quarantine included things that are very relatable to our situation today. So for example, things like duration of lockdown or quarantine, right? And that's something that we are experiencing right now. So even though we, even though in Canada, the situation is improving and it's, more and more businesses are, become, are, are beginning to be opened. We really still don't know how long COVID-19 is going to last for, right? how long is it gonna take us to develop a vaccine? And we don't know if the situation will worsen and businesses and, and, and parks and everything will have to be locked down again. There is also reports of the fear of infection, 
right, for ourselves and, and others. Right? And this is probably something that a lot of people are experiencing right now, particularly if you or someone you know is older or who is immunocompromised. There were reports of frustration and boredom. And that's probably not too surprising because we are living in, in a situation of environmental monotony where much of what we do, whether it's work, whether it's leisure, whether it's relaxation, it's all happening in roughly the same place, right? Our, our houses and, and, uh, and maybe our backyards. And it's a little bit better these days when parks have become open. But for many of us, right, especially for the first month or two of lockdown, right, there was a lot of environmental monotony. There were also reports in the literature of stressors related to inadequate supplies. Again, something that many of us have experienced, especially earlier on with a shortage of toilet paper. Uh, there were, it was very difficult to get our hands on things like soap and hand sanitizer. It's a little bit better now, but you know, even if you look on the shelves, it's, it can still be very difficult to find Lysol spray, for example. There is worry about finances, right? and again, very relatable these days, where many people are losing their jobs, right? and many people who still have their jobs may be worried about one day losing their job. Right? So finances were a stressor that many people reported in previous instances of quarantine. And then lastly is stigma. And by stigma, what, what they're referring to is stigma of once having, for example, if we did, for example, get COVID-19, there may be stigma or worry about how other people may view us. Are they going to stay away from us? Are they going to keep a distance from us, for example? How may other people interact with us? Now, all those stressors, right, both pre-COVID-19 and during COVID-19, those stressors can be very overwhelming, right? And as, as you look at that list of stressors from the previous slide and compare it to your own, you'll probably notice that we undergo a lot of stress on a day-to-day -day basis, both before and especially during COVID-19. Now, what we're looking at on this slide are reports from teachers. So this was a survey that was conducted by Mark Brackett and his colleagues at Yale University in collaboration with the Collaborative for Social, Emotional, and Academic Learning. And what they did was shortly after lockdown, and this is done in the United States, so shortly after lockdown, they sent a survey out to over 5,000 teachers. And what they asked the teachers to, to reflect upon or to identify were the three most frequent emotions that they felt each day. Okay, so in the leftmost column, that's the survey or, or the response of those teachers shortly after the COVID-19 pandemic. So you will see that in March 2020, the three most frequently reported emotions that the teachers felt each day included anxiousness, being overwhelmed, worried, fearful, and sad. The column adjacent to that, so under, under 2017, there is a column with five other emotions that teachers reported feeling each day. And these are, these are the emotions that teachers, again, frequently reported that they felt each day. And this is three years before the COVID-19 outbreak. And what you can see is that even though there are some similarities, there are also, there's at least one big difference that I notice. Right? So I'll give you a moment to sort of reflect and to, to look, take a look at the two different columns and to see if you can, if you notice or, 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 or what your thoughts are on the differences between the two columns. So what you, what you might notice is that there, there is some overlap right, in the emotions that teachers felt each day. Right, things like overwhelmed and, and stressed, maybe frustrated and tired. So there are a lot of these, I'm gonna use the word negative emotions, right? There are a lot of these negative emotions that teachers felt each day, even before the COVID-19 outbreak. Now, what this might tell us is that teaching is an incredibly difficult job, right? Teaching is hard. But what is interesting is if you take a look and compare those two different columns, you will see that the word happy showed up in 2017, 
which unfortunately did not make the list in March 2020. Right? In fact, in March 2020, we don't really see the presence of a positive emotion. So what this might tell us was that even though teaching is difficult, and again, I'm talking pre-COVID-19 right now, that even though teaching is difficult, teachers, for the most part, I reported feeling happy. So this might say something about job satisfaction. Now, unfortunately, as a result of the pandemic, all those positive emotions are now no longer present. So it is a very difficult time in order to be a teacher right now. So one of the difficulties with teaching during the COVID-19 outbreak is in addition to all the stressors that we typically experience and the stressors that have been exacerbated as a result of the outbreak, we are also undergoing a lot of social isolation, particularly in the first two or three months of lockdown. And it turns out that both stress and isolation impact some really critical brain areas that are involved and that have been implicated in, in, in us doing our jobs. So for example, Right. Problem solving, decision making, and learning and memory have been are, are, are presumably severely impacted by both stress and isolation. So those areas not only affect our ability to work, they also impact our students' ability to learn. So when you piece all those together, and those when you piece those two components together of how stress and isolation impacts our, impacts our students' learning and our ability to work, that really can make teaching during this time extremely difficult. On this slide, I've displayed a quote from Yoon that describes the relationship between teacher and student stress. And this quote reads, teachers' stress levels predicted the number of students with whom they had negative relationships. So what I'd like you to do at this point is to pause your video for a minute or two and to think about and to reflect on what are some possible reasons for this relationship. We think, when we think about possible reasons for this relationship, there really isn't a right or wrong answer, but some possibilities might be, for example, if we are stressed, Right, that might put us in a negative mood. And therefore, we might then apply that mood to our interpretations of a variety of different scenarios. So take, for example, if a student were yawning in our class, whether you see that through a Zoom call in the little in, in the video icon, or whether or not that's happening in a face-to-face -face classroom. If we are in a positive mood, we may be more likely to come up and generate multiple hypotheses for a single behavior. We might say, for example, maybe the student had a late night, maybe the student worked long hours, maybe the student stayed up to work on an assignment, and they're simply tired, but they're still coming to class and they're still trying to learn. Now, if we are in a more negative mood, Right? So if we are stressed, then we, might, we may be more likely to discredit or to not generate or come up with as many alternative interpretations for a single behavior. We might come up with something like, oh, the student is yawning because the student isn't engaged. The student is bored of my lesson and the student is being disrespectful. And what that could do is that could escalate our relationship with the student. It can escalate a negative type of conversation. Now, alternatively, what could also happen when we're stressed is we're not gonna perform our job as well. When we don't perform our job as well, right, the students are likely going to notice that. And that might then lead the students to think that we're either not prepared for our classes or perhaps we're not well-versed in our content area and we may therefore lose some respect from the student, right? So as our stress levels go up, that can impact that relationship that we have with the student. Now, conversely, if our students are stressed, but we're okay, that can also have negative implications because if our students are stressed, and remember, stress impacts students' ability to learn and to remember. If the students are stressed, they're not going to be able to learn as well. Right? So they're not going to be able to learn as well as they typically would. And therefore, that might impact our teaching because 
we might feel that we're not doing a good job in our teaching and that's why our students are not learning from us. So hopefully with those examples, you can see that teacher and student stress are bi-directional and that they are related and that one really can impact the other. Thankfully, it's not all doom and gloom. Thankfully, there are a variety of ways in which we can reduce our own stress. So we're gonna try a technique together, but only if you are comfortable. The choices that you have are guided meditation, performing a breathing exercise, online adult coloring, or listening to music of your choice. Now, if none of these options sound interesting to you, or if none of them is something that you're interested or, or comfortable performing, then feel free to perform an activity of your choice, something that you might typically do in order to unwind or to relax. Before I talk about how this is going to work, and before we take a break to actually perform these activities, I want to talk a little bit more about mindfulness. So mindfulness is something that I introduced very early on in this session. And even though there isn't a solid scientific definition for mindfulness, much of the scientific community seems to agree on a definition that was first proposed by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn. And that is mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So the basic premise of mindfulness is that much of our stress is a result of us ruminating about the past. Maybe there's something that happened in the past that we weren't proud of, right? So ruminating about the past or worry about the future, right? The what ifs. What if, for example, I lose my job? Or what if I don't do so well on my assignment? And the basic premise of mindfulness is to help us bring our thoughts back to the present moment right, in a non-judgmental fashion. So if mindfulness is something you're interested in exploring, I would recommend choosing either guided meditation or performing the breathing exercise because there are elements of mindfulness already built into them. What I'd like you to do is if you are interested in performing one of the four options that I described and that I presented to you, simply scroll down to the video description portion of this YouTube page and click the link that corresponds to the activity that you're interested in. And they are all about five minutes long, so take about a five minute break, pause this video, perform that activity that you're interested in, and then come back to this video for the remainder of the session. So how do you feel after the activity? For many people, you'd likely feel perhaps less stressed, more calm, and or more relaxed. For others, perhaps the particular activity that you chose didn't work for you as well as you had hoped or expected. And that may not be too surprising because stress is so personal and it is so contextual. And what I mean by that is a particular stressor that may be perceived to be negative by one person may be perceived as positive for another. And something we'll talk about later on is that there likely isn't a one size fits all relaxation or wellness practice that works for everyone. Right, which is why it's important to have variety and it's important to choose something that works for you. Now, before performing the activity, we did talk a little bit about mindfulness. And one of the reasons why we're talking about mindfulness is that there is some evidence that mindfulness-based activities can benefit both teachers and students. In fact, in a fairly recent systematic review that was published by von der Emps and colleagues, they reported that when they looked through the literature, that mindfulness-based interventions was one of the most effective techniques for teachers. There is accumulating evidence that the brain undergoes remarkable change or plasticity well into adulthood. And there is some really 
fascinating work that has come out of the lab of Dr. Richard Davidson from the University of Wisconsin-Madison that suggests that mindfulness activities may have the potential to change or to alter the brain to better respond to stress. About two years ago, Dr. Davidson and his colleagues performed an experiment on longtime meditators. And what they found was the response of the amygdala, which is this emotional processing center of the brain, actually responded the least when presented with negative stimuli among those participants who meditated the most. There is also some complementary evidence from other labs that suggest that mindfulness-based activities, such as meditation, may actually both increase the size and the activity of the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. The prefrontal cortex has been implicated in its roles in what are called executive functions, so things like goal planning and decision making. And the, the hippocampus has long been implicated in its role in learning and memory. So taken together, what these studies might suggest is that by performing these mindfulness-based wellness practices, that not only can we better, not only can we train ourselves to be better able to respond to stress, but it might actually help us learn, remember, and to work by increasing the size and the activity of both the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. In addition to research looking at the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, there is also accumulating evidence and research to suggest that mindfulness-based techniques, even in the short term, so even for 20 or 30 minutes, may be able to reduce both psychological, so self-perceived stress, and also a host of biological markers of stress, including, for example, reductions in blood pressure and heart rate and reductions in the stress hormone cortisol. So, so far, we've talked a lot about mindfulness and mindfulness-based activities. And you had the opportunity to perform one of four different techniques that I presented you with, whether that was guided meditation, breathing exercise, adult coloring, or listening to music. Now, something that what I'd like you to think about and what I'd like you to do is to take a couple of minutes to reflect on, to think about, and to jot down what are some other relaxation activities that you've either heard of or that you're currently practicing, right? So feel free to pause the video at this point for a couple of minutes and to jot down some of those activities. When you look at the list that you reflected on, that you created, you probably came up with a pretty big list of relaxation techniques. And again, this goes back to our discussion on how stress is both personal and contextual. Because stress is so personal, there likely isn't a single relaxation technique that works for everyone. And this is probably why so many different techniques exist. The list that you're seeing on this slide here is one that I've generated based on what some more popular types of relaxation techniques are and is something that I, in this list I came up with by informal conversation that I've had with students and colleagues, both here at Conestoga, but also at the inst other institutions that I've worked at. So the first one you see on the list is mindfulness meditation. Now, if you own a smartphone, so whether that's an iPhone or an Android, and you've browsed their app store, you've likely come across several different forms of mindfulness-based meditation applications, such as Headspace or Calm, which are probably the two more commonly used ones. There is accumulating evidence that when you use these applications, right, whether it's Headspace or Calm, that it can be highly effective in reducing our stress. There's also evidence that by performing adult coloring, whether using pencil crayon and a piece of paper 
or downloading an application, that that can also be very effective in reducing stress. Now, what is interesting about adult coloring is that it appears that there really isn't a difference whether you perform coloring using an online application, such as one you download on your smartphone, or whether you use pencil crayon and a piece of paper. There is some also interesting suggestion that when you add a component of mindfulness to your adult coloring, that you might give adult coloring a bit of a boost, that you might actually be, for lack of a better word, more relaxed right, when you perform those activities. Third on the list is listening to music. Now, when many people think about listening to music, they might make the assumption that there is a one size kind of fits all type of music to reduce stress for everyone. And usually people think about things like classical music. And while there is research to support the effectiveness of classical music, interestingly, there is beginning to become evidence to suggest that that may not work for everyone. And what seems to be most effective is when you give individuals a choice in what they listen to. Again, maybe not too surprising given how contextual and personal stress is. Casual video games have also received some evidence in the literature as an effective form of stress reduction. And by casual video games, I'm not talking about really action-packed ones like Call of Duty. I'm talking about video games that are easy to play, easy to understand, and with next to no learning curve, or right? something you can simply pick up, right? something you simply pick up and you can play on the go and re requires very little learning, very little learning curve, almost no learning curve. And then lastly on the list are nature-related activities, right? sometimes called forest bathing, whether that's taking a walk in nature or something else, that appears to be quite common these days uh, or popular is gardening, right? There is evidence to suggest that when we spend time in nature, that might have beneficial effects. Now, what is interesting that what is that in a fairly recent systematic review that was written and published by Hansen and colleagues, they found that when you present individuals with a nature video, that that might be just as effective as actually engrossing ourselves and, and surrounding ourselves in nature, sort of physically. And the take home message right, for all of this is that there are a lot of relaxation techniques that exist. And when you look into the literature, you will likely find that someone has conducted a study on a relaxation technique that you've heard of. And you've probably found through the literature that that particular technique right, is effective. Right? So when you look at the literature, there are a lot of studies that are conducted and there are a lot of, there is a lot of research to suggest that a variety of different techniques work and that are effective. And again, that's probably not surprising, right? Because what appears to be the case is that stress and relaxation techniques are personal and they're contextual. So they're really, and very likely isn't a one size fits all. When you do look at the comparisons that do exist in the research literature, there really isn't overwhelming evidence that one technique is better than another. So for example, in a recent systematic review that was published by Goyal and colleagues, they found, for instance, that meditation wasn't really any more effective than performing exercises. There is some interesting research, and this is something I talked about in the previous slide, to suggest that when we, when we apply an element of mindfulness to the activities that we typically perform, that that might give it a bit of a boost. Now, unfortunately, this is still quite in its infancy. So there's not a lot of research in this already. So it will be interesting to see what this looks like in a few years. So for the last portion of this session, I'd like to talk a little bit about how some instructors have tried to implement mindfulness practices into the classroom and what they found. So the first study is a qualitative study that was conducted by Hartel and colleagues who began each day of their class with a three minute mindfulness meditation session. And after a period of time, 
they then interviewed their students about their experiences performing these sessions, performing these mindfulness uh, practices. And what you see in the bottom half of the slide are two quotes that appears to be representative of their student experiences. So in the first quote, and that reads, these exercises did wonders to relieve my stress so that I could concentrate and absorb the lectures, especially at 9 a.m. So what you can see from this quote is that this particular student felt that the mindfulness meditation sessions actually help them be able to absorb the lectures and to concentrate, right? Perhaps by virtue of reducing that student stress. Now, the second quote reads, the mindfulness exercises grounded me in the middle of the week and made me feel prepared to learn. And now what this quote suggests, right? So if you combine those two quotes together, is that mindfulness-based practices might, may not only be able to help students reduce stress, but it might also help students do better academically. So I want to follow that study up by another study that was conducted by a different group of researchers. And in this study, these researchers wondered whether or not performing meditation prior to a quiz will help students perform better. So they repeated this experiment three times. So three separate experiments were performed on introductory psychology students. And prior to the quiz, students were signed, assigned either to a meditation group or a group who rested silently. Right? So once they performed either meditation or rested silently, the students performed the quiz. And what these researchers found was that the students in the meditation group consistently scored higher on a quiz than those who rested silently. Right? So Keep in mind that this was three separate experiments. And in all three experiments, the researchers found that those participants who were in the meditation group performed better, right? So the, the, experiment or the experiments were, were repeated and the results were replicated. So what this might suggest to us is that if we are able to help students feel calmer, to feel less stressed out, that that might actually have a benefit on their performance prior to an assessment. Okay? Or it might also suggest that mindfulness-based meditation may actually help students perform better, perhaps even independent of stress reduction. Right? So this is sort of an interesting field. And you can see that these citations are relatively new. So it will be very interesting to see with more research what implications my mindfulness and or meditation might have in the classroom setting. So just to summarize this portion of the session up, right, there, as you can see, that there is growing interest in the incorporation of mindfulness practices in the classroom. And from those studies that we just talked about, right, it is interesting to see that there is evidence that these practices might be effective, not just for stress reduction, but maybe also for learning. Right, either independent of each other, or perhaps that there is some relationship between the two. If this is something you're interested in incorporating into your classroom, right, something to keep in mind is to make sure that the activities that you choose are inclusive, making sure that your students have a choice, and even if your students have a choice, also making sure that your students have the ability to opt out if they are uncomfortable participating in the activity. This slide here, what I wanted to do was to share with you some phone applications that you can use on the go. So if you have a moment of need where you're feeling really stressed out and you just need something to help you relax, I've shared with you on this slide the names of some pretty common phone applications that you can download and these applications are free or low cost and that you could play on the go or that you can use on the go. So the words in bold are the category. So for example, mindfulness meditation and guided breathing and everything underneath it that's not in bold are examples of applications, right? So Headspace and Calm, for example. Anything with an asterisk 
beside them or star is an application that has received some research support in the literature. Right, so I hope this list of applications will help you out and give you some ideas for some of the relaxation applications that exist and that may help you uh, unwind or to relax when you really need it. And lastly, and most importantly, thank you for participating in this session. Take care.